All right. Uh, welcome to, yes, that's on. Make sure I don't have that problem again. Uh, <laughs> welcome to week 10. Uh, we're talking about database security this week. Um, again, a very theory heavy concept. So I'm going to talk about database security, the definitions, uh, some guidelines, how to make your database install secure. And this applies to pretty much everything, every database server, not just MySQL. This is a pretty generic concept. Uh, there'll be some quick examples at the end, specific to MySQL. Um, we're going to talk about principles of least privilege, types of privileges, and that kind of stuff. All right, so database security. Database security ensures that only authorized users can perform authorized actions at authorized time. Do you notice what words repeat, repeated lots in that sense? It's authorized. It's just basically saying whoever's accessing the database is actually allowed to access the database, allowed to do what they're trying to do when they're trying to do it. Uh, how many of you here work where you may have a like a badge that lets you in or out of an office space, but it doesn't work during certain times of the day? Um, when I used to work for Compaq, this was a long time ago, we had badges and these were for the phone techs because they had a call center in Bell's Corners with 1,700 technicians back when, you know, there's still a lot of that kind of stuff in the Ottawa Valley. Um, if you were not scheduled to work, your badge wouldn't let you in the building. So half an hour before the start of your shift to half an hour after the end of your shift, your badge would work. Any time outside of that, your badge would not work. They didn't want people coming into the building when they weren't supposed to be there, which is fair, uh, but it is what it is. Um, so the concept of database security is determining what users are supposed to allow to be do, to allow, allowed to do, and enforce the requirements using features both from the database and the application program, and sometimes physical security also. Um, so most database products provide security facilities. Uh, they can limit what actions can be done to what and by whom. Um, pretty much every database server has username and password security. I mean, that just goes without saying. A lot of database servers are now starting to use other ways of connecting. Um, MySQL does not. But the Microsoft SQL Server, for example, allows you to do a domain authentication. So it authenticates against the Windows domain before it lets you connect. Uh, Postgres allows you to connect with an SSL certificate. You don't even need a username. You just feed it a certificate and it says, oh, I know who you are. You're allowed to talk to me. Oracle has all kinds of things. Um, it's kind of cool. Now, there's all kinds of ways of handling these, these things. So the database security model, the way it works is you'll have a user. A user may or may not be assigned to a role. Um, the combination of the user and the roles they belong to determines their permissions. And their permissions is tied to an object. So we got ourselves a cute little ERD here that shows how everything is connected yet optional. Because um, a user may not belong to a role or a role may not have users. An object may or may not have permissions. The user may or may not have permissions on the object. Um, and the permissions are cumulative. In other words, you have your basic permissions as a user, and then if you belong to a role or more than one role, it'll take those permissions, add them on top of your basic permissions, and slowly, the permission system in most database engines is uh, a cumulative data uh, permission system. In other words, you start out with no permissions, and as it collects the information about you, you log in, it checks what groups you belong to, it takes all the permissions from all the different things you belong to, adds them up and determines what you're allowed to do. Um, in Windows, something similar in Windows is uh, called ACL, access control lists. If you belong to different groups, each group lets you do certain things to win, to this machine or access different resources on the network. It's the same idea. So you have your basic permissions, you have groups that can give you more permissions or roles, depending on what database server you're talking about. Take all the permissions together, compare them to the objects. Does, so is Dan allowed to select from customers? No. Oh, but Dan is part of the customer relations team. Customer relations team is allowed to retrieve from customers. So it'll look at the permissions from there and say, oh, but yes, Dan is allowed to select star from customers. 
because they had the permission through the role. Okay, so security guidelines. Run the database server behind a firewall. So this is literally, we're talking about actual physical security here, more or less. Um, but you always got to plan as if the firewall is not there or does not exist. Uh, why? Because no security is foolproof. Uh, you can ask all the companies that have had their data breached in the last 10 years about how good their security is. Uh, it's not. There's always a hole, no matter how good your security is. Uh, you want to make sure that your operating system and the database is patched up as up to date for whatever version you're running. Um, if you're running, you know, Ubuntu server, you want to make sure that it's patched up all the latest security patches for Ubuntu's running. If you're running MySQL 8.1, you want to make sure you're running on the latest version of MySQL 8.1. You might not want to go to 8.2 if 8.2 is out, but you want to make sure you're up to date for 8.1. Um, just make sure that, you know, security is as tight as it can be. Uh, you want to use the least functionality possible. So support the fewest network protocols possible. So MySQL allows one way to connect, network socket. Oracle supports three ways to connect, network socket, a named pipe, and some other thing. I don't remember exactly what it is. A FIFO buffer, I think it's called, which is kind of weird. Um, Postgres, again, it does a similar thing where you got IPv4, IPv6, you've got network uh, named pipes, you've got FIFO buffers, you've got all kinds of things. What they're saying is turn off anything you don't want to use. The fewer things that are not used, actually the fewer things that are used, that means there's less ways to attack. Um, picture you have a house and all the windows are open and then a storm rolls in. Rain comes in the window because your windows are open, right? If you closed all those windows, the rain wouldn't come in through those windows. Same idea. Close the pipes on the server. It's not an attack vector. Um, delete unnecessary unused system store procedures. That one doesn't really apply to MySQL. Hang on. Try not to delete. There we go. Um, but a lot of database servers will have uh, system level stored procedures. Um, you have to be really careful though, when you start deleting these, because you might actually delete something the server needs. But again, this is back to the point of the fewer things that are there, the less attack vectors there are. Um, I mean, there's been some really interesting ways of breaching servers over the years. Um, years and years and years and years ago, like long, long time ago. Some of you are probably like that big. Um, there was a vulnerability for um, the, one of the first versions of Apache, the Apache web server, where if you fitted a URL that had certain characters in it, it would let you start executing commands on the disk. So the rule is, is you turn things off as much as you can. That means there's less holes. Uh, de de disable default logins and guest users, if possible. Never, ever have a guest user on your database server, it's just a hole. Um, unless required, never allow all users to log onto the database server interactively. That's saying, don't let people connect using SQL directly. Don't let everybody, don't, don't, there'll be the odd person that has to, like the server administrator or, you know, this, the engineers or whatever. But you don't want Jim Bob, the manager, connecting and running SQL commands. That's just stupid. So you should also protect the computer that runs the database. Nobody should be allowed to sit at the computer that runs the database server, except for the server admin. And even then, there's no reason for them to sit there unless the server has shit the bed. By that, I mean the RAID array has lost a disk. The stick of RAM has gone bad, and they need to turn it off fix it, turn it on, and make sure it's working. There's never a reason to have someone sit at the database server. Uh, that's one of the perks of having everything running in Amazon. There is no database server to sit at. It's sitting at a data somewhere, data center somewhere in, in, our, in our case, somewhere in North Carolina. And the number of people that are allowed to touch those computers, you can probably count them on one hand. Yeah, so there'll be a, maybe five technicians on any given shift 
that are actually allowed to walk into those rooms. And even then, they can't even connect to your database server because it's running as a VM. Um, the database server should be physically contained, secured behind locked doors. Um, yeah, I think that goes without saying. You're not going to leave your car unlocked. on Preston Street. You're not going to leave your server room unlocked because that's, you're just asking for someone to come and take your shit. Um, access to the room containing the database server should be recorded in a log. In other words, if the company you work for has an appropriate amount of money, the person should be able to test to tap to get in. When you tap, it logs who accessed the room. So at least they know if suddenly, hey, the server went down and uh, strangely enough, all the hard drives disappeared out of the server. Oh, Dan was in there last. Hmm, I wonder who took the hard drives. So that's why you want to log who has access to the room. Um, cheap companies will have just a key to unlock the door. Really stupid. Um, but, you know, they do. Like where I was working, our old location, um, we only had a key to get into the room, but there was a camera pointing at the door. That recorded 24 hours a day. Second, there was like a basically like a blink camera. The second that there was movement by the door, it started recording. So we knew whoever was touching that door. So, you know, almost as good. Uh, just wear a mask. <laughs> or if you know the cameras there, you just put a piece of paper in front of it, then go steal the shit and then take the piece of paper off, you know. Uh, whatever. Uh, you want to manage accounts and passwords. Uh, you want to allow a low privileged user access to the database server. You do not want to give everybody root access in MySQL, for example. Um, you want to use strong passwords. That one I have an argument with. Um, you hear all about, oh, make sure your password's strong and secure. Okay. If I am touching the keyboard of that server and I'm able to get the command prompt, there's no password on earth that's going to save you from me. Postgres, if I have root access to that file system, Postgres, 45 seconds, I can disable all the passwords. Not in 45 seconds. I, I tried it once. I think I did it in under 15 seconds. It's it's amazing how easy it is. Um, MySQL, stop the server, copy the files. Bring them home, take your time, cry getting past the password, which is literally just changing the root password. Yes, have a, have a password. Don't make it ABC123 password, but you do not need a 26 character keyboard vomit password either. Just make it reasonable. Yeah. Best security for a database server, number one is don't let them touch it. If you can avoid letting people touch your database, you've covered like 70% of the security. Because if I got physical access to your server, even if it's a server, especially if it's like not even on a RAID, array is just like a server with like an SSD in it, just take the drive and go home with it. Take my time. Right? Just, trust me, the lock, the lock on that server rack, it won't stop me. And I'm not talking lock picking lawyer level here. I'm talking about McNally mode. Just rake it. The door's open. Well, they're not in a building. They're not in the building. They're they're in locked environments like at Amazon. Like in each data center, any given day, I think there's five to six people that can access the machine. And even then the machines are encrypted, so that's useless to take the drive. So this is on premise. Uh for the most part. Like some of these slides are old because a lot of people are going to cloud, but on premise. But we, everybody's going to have database servers of some sort on premise, regardless. Like, there's always something in the building. So, this applies to that. Um, <clears throat> you should monitor failed login attempts. If somebody fails to log in, you should probably keep track of the fact when people are trying to hack your system. They log in, they forgot their password, or they forgot their password. Um, you should audit your users and your roles and your memberships. Make sure that you know you're not accidentally giving people permissions they shouldn't have. Uh, audit accounts with null passwords. Uh, realistically, nothing should have a null password. Going back to my whole thing, you don't need like the world's hardest password to remember, but you should have a password. So you shouldn't have users with null passwords because then they can log in without a password. You just need to know what the username is. 
Um, so you assign accounts to the lowest privileges possible. Uh, you might even want to limit the DBA's account privileges. So there's only one super user. The DBA cannot destroy the database server. Um, you know, got to be careful on who can do what. At my company, you know, if I really want to piss them off, I can just hit a checkbox, go delete, type in, delete me, and it's gone. You know, because I have super user access to our Amazon environment. Um, planning. Uh, develop a security plan for preventing and detecting security problems. With anything else you always want to plan, you want to make sure that you have a what they call a, uh, a playbook. So you discover that the database server was breached. What's the first thing you're going to do? If it's an electronic breach, you probably pull the wire out of the back. Make sure that they stop copying stuff. You, know, you have a playbook. You go, okay, if it's this, we do these next steps. If it's this, we do these next steps. You should plan. And then you create the, by the same token, you create procedures for the emergencies and you practice them. Uh, usually not during business hours. But you could, we've done it with one of our servers where we were going, hey, we've been hacked, quote, quote, hacked. So we took a, you know, an old server and we, cloned one of our production machines on it so we could practice and server got hacked and what did we do and you know we went through the whole process of oh we unplugged it out of the back turned it off turned it back on while it's not connected to make sure that they can't get back at it you know that kind of stuff um so you create a set of procedures it's a playbook every once in a while you'll want to review your playbook to make sure that you know hey you've replace these three servers with something else. So your playbook was written for Microsoft SQL Server and you got tired of paying the Microsoft tax. So you rolled out Postgres. Well, how you handle issues on Postgres will be different than how you handle on the Microsoft SQL Server. Therefore, you need to make sure that your playbook is still valid. Some of it's still the same, like, you know, unplug the server out of the network, you know, hunt down the guy who's running out of the building with a server under his arm. Hey, um, when somebody got fired, they literally ran into the server room and grabbed, tried to grab a server off the rack. Guy was a complete idiot. Um, no, the guy was a complete tool. Um, man, that's a story. Holy cow. If I have time at the end, I'll tell you that story. It's spectacular. Uh, <laughs> wow. That was, that was something else. Uh, I'm just remembering that now. It makes me chuckle, that whole story. All right, so application security. So if database security features are inadequate because, you know, it, there's only so much it can do, additional security code could be written in the application. Um, so application security in web-based app is often provided by the web server and not the database. So have you guys written any code yet that connects to a database? From Python, for example? One username, one password, right? And your connection string. I'm I'm going with that assumption for Python. It's like it's like that in PHP, so it's pretty much the same in Python. So you need that user to be able to select, update, delete, insert, do everything you know that things does. So you know, so all the security has to be provided by Apache and or your Python PHP PHP C sharp code, right? The application needs to provide the security because that user can do anything it wants to that database. And if you've designed it properly, that user cannot create new objects, can't, you know, create new tables or databases or delete objects. That's a good one. But that's just one user can do anything to the database, right? So web development's a little weird. You had a question? No, I answered your question, but your statement at the same time. So that's the problem, right? You've got one user that has basically unlimited privileges on that database. And a lot of people, when they create that user, how many of you have run a WordPress site or installed WordPress? What's one of the first things it asks you while you're doing the install? And it has to have create, drop, alter table. The user has to have privileges to basically do anything but drop the database. WordPress, good job. Can I like 
create another tool to use a bit low fragmentation and use that in my backend, but it's impossible. You need to update the seed. Yeah, which is fine because that user needs that. So what you end up having is you should have a super user of some sort like root on MySQL to create the database, create the database structure. And then you have a separate user that doesn't have any schema privileges. So it has CRUD, right? Create, retrieve, update, delete, but none of the alter, uh, add, uh, create, or drop. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, um, a CRM I was investigating years ago would ask you for two users during the setup process. It would ask you for the super user account and the database user account. And what it would do is it would run the super user account, create the database, create the database user, and then forget what the super user information was. It would configure the application only run with the privilege, the least privileged user, which was basically insert, update, and delete, and select. Well, you're talking about like an art, like a if you're talking about RDS or Aurora or Redshift or any of their database services, um, you have usually at least one user, which is the super user and then depending on which database engine you're talking about then you can create additional users with less privileges it's not as easy as a standalone server well it just depends on how you set it up but there's no one fit one one like for example my amazon user can touch everything in our account I added recently added another user who is now needing to profile some one of the databases because his code sucks. And every time it has somebody uses this code, the database server cries for mummy. Uh, and I wish I was joking. Like we're talking, the database server is running at 12% utilization and somebody loads over one of his pages and it goes to 99% for three minutes. That's a shitty code. So he now needs to understand why his queries are bad. So I needed to give him permission to actually go look at the performance profile. No, no, you create, you create, you create the appropriate users. And Amazon gives you half a dozen ways to create users. You can use the database native database user, you can use a, an IAM user, you could use an incognito user. There's dozens of ways to authenticate. You could just use keys and SSL certificates. Or should you? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> that's that's your answer. Um, all right. So you should try to use database security features first, which is the back to his question where, you know, you got the super user has access to everything. What do I do with the application itself? If it doesn't need to modify the structure, you want to have the enforcement as close to the server as possible so that you don't have potential bugs in your code that will let somebody in. Um, as a rule of thumb, database security features are usually faster than anything you have in your code that you wrote yourself because the database server has less layers to deal with the security, right? It authenticates the user, and the second that user is authenticated, it knows what that person is allowed to do. It doesn't need to think about the permissions after that, because it knows. Um, probably result in higher quality results in developing your own, that one's arguable. Uh, it depends on whether or not you're able to switch the user that's currently accessing the, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with that, there's limits. Um, so user privileges, there is a principle of least privilege. It's a phrase used common in database security, an actual fact, server security in general. Uh, grant only the privileges actually needed for each user. Again, as his example, what happens that when you set up the application, you got a super user, create, create tables and blah, blah, blah. But we want to use a least privileged user. So therefore, we'll probably want a user that can insert, update, delete, and select. And that's all they're allowed to do. No alter, no create, no drop, no truncate, no, you know, just want to avoid that stuff as much as possible. 
And even then, uh, depending on what kind of application it is, like we have a few applications at work where the that application is read-only. It's only for running reports. So that user only has select. So I created a separate user in our instance in our database instance in Amazon. It's an actual Postgres user, but it's read-only on that one database for those only those tables. I gave it read-only privileges on specific tables only for those reports. So if ever that application gets compromised, then again, a user can't do anything. So you try to go minimum privileges for whoever's accessing your database server. Some database servers I'll also limit where the person's allowed to connect from. MySQL is a good example. You can give it an IP address or subnet. Postgres is the same. You can give it a specific IP address. You can give it a subnet with a um, subnet mask. Um, so you can limit where the person is allowed to connect from. Maybe you don't want anybody connecting to this database server except from 10.0.2, the 1002 subnet, which might just so happen to be, you know, our Amazon subnet. That means that anybody in the home, in the office in Ottawa, the office in Toronto, if they're coming from there, they can't connect to the database server. Just applications running in Amazon can connect to it. If you can't connect to it, there's no security hole. So you want to only get permissions from the hosts that are going to be connected from. Okay. Never use blank passwords. Um, should be complex and contain alphanumeric and special characters. Yes. By complex, it doesn't mean it needs to be a 32 character keyboard vomit. Like literally ABC123 exclamation mark at pound is actually a complex password. Is it a good complex password? No. But it's technically a complex password. And that would be, you know, better than just password. Because password, you know. Um, in MySQL, there used to be a function called password. That's what you'd use to set a password. It's been deprecated uh, because it used a really stupid hash the passwords. And uh, if you had access to the file, to the database table that had the passwords in it, you could basically, you know, crack any password in seconds. Um, now they have SHA2. They have other things also, uh, better, even better security. Than that, um, I know they. I know some database servers like Postgres uses uh, Scram, Scram Five, I think it's called Scram Six, something like that, to secure your passwords. Passwords are like that long when it's done with it, with it, and it's almost impossible to ever crack it. SHA two. Yeah, yeah, but this is for the actual database user. So, so you know when you create a user in MySQL, you know when you were doing the MySQL setup and it asks you for a password for your root user, it's actually do it's actually doing the hashing for you. The application like MySQL will do the hash by using a function to hash your password. No, it uses whatever it happens to be using, which is why password was deprecated uh, because password used MD5. Which is, you know, just amazing. Uh, and if you don't know about MD5 hashing, um, essentially every password under 32 characters has now been identified if it's MD5 hashed, regardless of what your password is. Uh, it's using something called Rainbow Table. So you've literally run it on the computer. They figured out the MD5 hash of every password, 32 characters, every special character. Even letters that are English. So French characters, you know, Spanish characters, Cyrillic characters, Chinese characters, 32 characters, they figured out what the hash is. So you can just go select password from rainbow table where the hash is equal to this and it gives you a password that'll work. Fantastic. So that's not allowed to happen in MySQL anymore. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people would use the same password in there as they would on, like, for the server. Suddenly, you know what the password is for the root user on there. Guess what? You probably got the root user password, too. Uh, amazing security. So, now talk about users and privileges. Uh, the principle of least privilege. 
A user process should have the least level of privilege. It limits access to the lowest possible level required to do the job. Uh, that's basically what least privilege means. Um, just like, um, actually, I can use my daughter's workplace as an example. So she works in a secure environment at the CRA as for her co-op. Her badge can't open the door across the hall. So she can get into her department. She can get into another department. I don't remember what the other department is. But if she goes across the hall to get into the, the headquarters department, she can't get in that door. Because she only has permissions on her badge to go into the doors she's allowed to access. Kind of cool. Same idea here. You, Like I said earlier before, you want to have your users have as little privileges as possible so that if your web application gets compromised and they read your config file and they see a user, a username and a password and a host, then even if they connect with that user, there's limits. So one of the common ways of, you know, you hear about the, oh, they hacked and extracted all the data. What they're often doing is they they found a server that has certain ports open on the internet that shouldn't be open. And they use an exploit and managed to log in as, as root on a Linux server. Or they got a, or they managed to install a um, root kit which is kind of fun too, which basically allows almost remote control over the internet of a server. And then they'll go log, walk through the web, you know, through the server. Oh, there's a web application on here. CD slash var slash triple W slash whatever the application is. Oh, look, there's a config file. Oh, look at that. There's a username, password, and a URL for the server. Oh, it's MySQL. Great. You know, control Q, enter, MySQL dash H dash U dash P whatever the database is called. Now you're logged in as that user. Um, I make it sound easy. It's not that easy, but it's that easy. Um, if you know what you're doing, it's really easy. So you want to have your applications using users with least amount of privileges because you don't want them to be able to do stuff they're not supposed to do. So there's a few different kinds of privileges. Admin privileges. Uh, it provides access to manage the server. It should be very limited and only limited to those who absolutely need it. These are the ones that can turn the server on and off. The ones that can start and stop the service that can add or remove other super users that can drop databases, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Uh, database privileges, ability to execute commands at the DB level such as drop DB. So the admin privilege could be one step above that. So person can log into the server, they logged in, they go sudo su, hit enter, type in a password, bang, they're now root. Nothing can go, you know, uh, system CTL space stop space MySQL, enter rm rf slash var slash lib slash MySQL, boop, database gone. Right, so I just explained you how to delete a MySQL database off of a Linux server in 10 seconds. That's admin privileges. Almost nobody should be allowed to do that. Database privileges means they have access to ability to drop the database. So they can't modify the server, but they can connect. So for example, my, the root user on MySQL, that is a highly privileged database user. It can drop any database. It can even drop the MySQL database, which is basically like giving the database server a lobotomy. You, you say MySQL, you no longer know how to be MySQL and it'll let you. Oh, yeah, I have to delete the whole server privilege. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's called being a, the, the admin. The, well, that's, you know, a different conversation. That's called being liable and going to court and owing lots of money. Yeah, no, dude, dude, you don't do that. No matter how much you hate your employer, that is not something you do. The amount of stories out of Tales from Tech Support I've read of that, don't ever do that. That's a good way to go to jail. That's called infoterrorism. No, God, no. They're going to put you in, uh, in there with the guy who robbed a bank. 
No, it's not, and it's not any better. They're, you're going in there with the big boys. Because they, they calculated on damages and to the company's financials. You know, you nuke a database that has all the customer information, that could be worth millions upon millions for the company. You're going to be charged with stealing millions of dollars. Grand theft larceny. Don't do that, ever. Ever. By the way, the, the story about the guy running out the server room, that's what he was trying to do. So, it's very close to that. So, I'll tell you that, guys, that story when I'm not recording. Um, and then you got the database object privileges. That means you're allowed to select stuff from tables, select from views. You know, lower privileges, not so dangerous. Uh, user administration. Uh, user access can be controlled when the user is created. You can set the IP addresses they're allowed to log in from, that kind of stuff. Um, when the user is created, they don't have privileges assigned by default. They literally, when you create a database user, they are allowed to do nothing by default. You have to give them permissions, him or her or it or whatever, permissions to do things. So in my SQL, uh, the syntax is create user. Again, if you have a user that's not allowed to create anything, you don't have to worry about that user ever creating a new user from themselves, right? So create user, username at host, identified by password. Um, username can be 16 characters long. The host can be an IP address, a wildcard. Uh, you'll notice it uses the good old percent sign with the like statement. Uh, so 192.168.1. percent means the entire subnet of 192.168.1. So anything from 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.1.255 will be able to connect. Uh, so the example at the bottom is create user uh, identified by password. So it's going to create a user called Lisa that's allowed to connect from local host. And her password is password. Not a good password. But MySQL is one of the weird ones out of all the database servers where you can actually give a person a different password depending on their host they're connecting from. So Lisa local host identified by password means if she's sitting at the Linux terminal, types in MySQL, whatever, and types in the username password, it'll let them in. But if she was trying to connect from 192168 1.12, she wouldn't even be able to connect because she doesn't have permissions to connect from that subnet, only from local host. But what you can do is create another Lisa user with 192.168.1. whatever, and give that user a different password. So then she could have a complex password when she's not sitting at the keyboard, but an easy password when she's sitting at the keyboard. MySQL is the only database server I've seen that does that. It's a cool feature, which scares the crap out of me because it's so easy to forget to do, to remove permissions from someone when they get turfed. Um, but it's a cool feature. Alter user. Uh, you can use that to change the user's password. So alter user identified by blah, blah, blah. Straightforward. Um, so changing user passwords. It used to be alter user well, for eight and up is the first one, which is ultra user, whatever, identified with MySQL native password by a string. And that will actually take that string, one, two, three, four, five, six, and convert into whatever hashing algorithm that version of MySQL is using. Cool. 5.7 was set password for user instead. Um, yeah. It's whatever it is. Uh, drop user. You have to, when you go to drop a user, you got to make sure you drop the user with the host name. Otherwise, it may not work. Um, then we have grant and revoke. So grant and revoke gives them privileges. The other commands create the user. Grant and revoke gives the permissions or takes permissions away. And um, the privileges are along lines of uh, all, select, insert, delete, update, create, alter, drop, usage. Usage means the user can log in, but they can't do anything. Which sounds kind of weird saying that this person has usage rights, but it means that they're allowed to connect, but they can't do crap. It's the default, basically the default privilege. 
Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. Uh, depending on what version of MySQL, yes. 5.7, you could. 8, I don't think you can. It's essentially you created the user. You want to make sure they can connect before you start giving them rights, essentially. So, for example, we want to grant all on dbmusic.star to db user identified by their password. Um, so essentially, there's a few different ways. Usually, you don't include the identified by, but you can actually give a person a different password to access certain objects. That's a MySQL thing. Nobody else does that. Um, so there's all kinds of different parts of the grant syntax. That's why we're just giving you guys a link. Because I guarantee for the lab, you're probably going to have to go look this up in one of the links because it's not going to cover everything you need for the lab. Uh, we do expect you guys are now going to be able to read documentation. <laughs> so, so but this is saying it says it's going to grant all privileges on a database, on all the objects in a database called dbmusic. So dbmusic.star. So it's going to grant all privileges on every object in dbmusic to user called dbuser. Uh, we could give it a password, or we could also go with grant option. With grant option means that user is not allowed to give other people permissions. So if you grant all with grant option, that user can create a new user and give them the same privileges they have. I, unless they're a database admin, there's no reason to give someone grant. Uh, revoke. So you gave everything to the person, but you don't want them to be able to add new data. Revoke insert. So that means that they can select, they can update, they can delete. Hang on, where are we now? Turn, 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 turn. Nope, the other way. There we go. Watch your toes. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It was you. There, no, no worries. It survived. It's still recording. It's better than what happened a couple of weeks ago. So that's how you revoke. So with grant revoke, there's no alter, no update. It's you give them permissions, you take permissions away. So the way this is set up right now, it's saying we gave everything to DB user and now we're taking away their rights for adding data. But they can still update and delete. They can still select. I've seen cases where the user only has insert rights. They can't update, they can't delete, they can't even select. ETL user, uh, electronic transform transformation, where it takes data from one database, converts it to something else, and gives it to another database. All that user should be allowed to do is put stuff in. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about programming in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, you can re remove all privileges, uh, revoke all privileges, come a grant option from user at this. That removes everything away. I have noticed that. With the labs, that sometimes some students, that syntax works on the first try, and for some students it does not. And I haven't figured out what it is. But the documentation shows you alternate ways of doing that command. I just don't know why, why it works for some people. I haven't. I can't even say, oh, it's the stupid Mac users versus the Windows users. It's not that. It's, I don't know what it is, because I've had one Mac user be able to do it, the one sitting next to them not. Why, I don't know. It might just be that they're running a slightly different version of MySQL. So it is what it is. And you got show grants. Show grants basically shows you what permissions a person has. So you go show grants for whatever the user at localhost. It'll show you that Lisa is allowed to do these things at localhost. If they had access from another server with different sets of privileges, then you go show grants for Lisa at 192.168 one dot percent sign it would show you what permissions she would have accessing it remotely and after you have created a user dropped a user granted or revoked privileges you have to flush the privileges because mysql only loads privileges at reboot so server comes up, now your server just rebooted, it loads all the privileges, stores them in memory. It caches all the rights so that it's not constantly asking the, the database, hey, what's Lisa allowed to do? Hey, what's Lisa allowed to do? It just keeps it in memory. So the flush, pri 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 flush privileges 
what it does, it says, hey, you need to relearn all your privileges now. So it'll clear them out of memory and reload them. So that way, any new rules, privileges, whether they were added, removed, whatever, is reset. Okay, so I'm going to hit the stop record so I can tell you my quick little story about the guy who uh, 